Hello, everyone. Please take your seats because we are almost going to start. A very warm welcome to all of you and especially to those who have been with us all weekends. Um, I'm uh, very happy that we have this lovely program in this weekend called Celebrating Descent. My name is Sophie Rutefrans. I'm an editor here at the Bali um, and I would love to introduce to you uh, the moderator of this special program on identity, Jürgen John Afon. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. It's very, very nice to be here back again moderating a program because uh, on a personal note, I used to work here when I was studying, which was ages ago. Then I feared out into the big world and tonight's the f to this afternoon is the first time being back as a moderator. So it feels very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Like Sophie said, a very warm welcome to you all. Welcome to uh, On Identity. This program, program is part of Celebrating Dissident. And it will discuss a hot topic in the current debate, namely identity and identity politics. While identity politics is not a new topic, it's been around since, let's say, the 60s. And the term identity politics, that refers to a tendency of people that share a particular racial or religious, ethnic, sexual, social, or cultural identity to form alliances, and it can be used as a tool for emancipation. Um, it's associated with uh, emancipation, uh, emancipation for groups as uh, the women's, women's movement, the civil rights movement in the US, the LGBTQ movement, as well as nationalist and post-colonial movement. But why? Why is this term so under debate right now? What are the negative and the uh, positive aspects of that? We will talk about that with, with a variety of speakers this afternoon. But before we start with that, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker. I'm very happy to introduce you to Kenan Malik. He's an Indian-born British writer, he's a lecturer, he's a broadcaster, and he's trained in neurobiology and the history of science. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and a columnist for The Observer, and an occasional columnist for The New York Times and The Gothenburg Posten. I haven't read his columns in The Gothenburg Posten, to be honest. <laughs> um, tonight, he will give us a lecture on his take on identity and identity politics. Please give a warm hand to Kenan Malik. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I've had, ever had a, that kind of an introduction before. Okay, I kind of it's, it's very nice. It's, it's a pleasure and honour to be here. Um, I only wish I was, I was here. I'd been here yesterday as well, uh, but I've only just got here. So. Um, it's, it's a, it is a real pleasure and honour to be speaking here. Let me just get some water. Um, identity politics. It's, it's become one of the defining um, and divisive issues of the age. And for many on the left, um, as Jürgen suggested, it's merely another way of talking about the struggles of minority groups against discrimination and oppression. And many argue that without identity politics, there can be no defence of minority rights of minority groups. And there are many who argue that those who argue against identity politics are reactionary or racist or are not interested in, in um, minority rights. That's a perspective I want to argue against today. I want to suggest, on the contrary, that the politics of identity is an obstacle to, and not a weapon in, the struggle for equal rights and justice, and that we should not confuse identity politics with the struggles for women's rights or gay rights or equal rights for Muslims and so on. And to, do, to, to make this point, I, I want to make eight basic points through which I hope to give a quick tour of both the history and the politics of identity and of identity politics. The first point is this, that we need to distinguish between identity and the politics of identity. Identities have great significance to all of us. They give us a sense of ourselves, of our grounding in the world and of our relationships to others. Politics, though, is or should be a means of taking us beyond the narrow sense of identity given to each of us by the specific circumstances of our lives or the 
particularities of our personal experiences. As a teenager, I was drawn to politics because of my experience of racism. But if it was racism that drew me to politics, it was politics that made me see beyond the narrow confines of racism. I came to learn that there was more to social justice than challenging the injustices done to me, and that a person's skin colour or ethnicity or culture provides no guide to the validity of his or her political beliefs. Through politics, I discovered the, the writings of Marx and Mill, of Baldwin and Arendt, of James and Fanon. Most of all, I discovered that I could often find more solidarity and commonality with those whose ethnicity or culture was different to mine, but who shared my values, and with those with whom I have a common ethnicity or culture, but not the same political vision. Politics, in other words, was not shackled to my identity, but helped me reach beyond it. It allowed me to see that my personal experiences and identity were insufficient to help me formulate my values and ideals. Today, though, politics, far from taking us beyond our narrow identities, has often become circumscribed by them. What we are often defines what we should cherish or value or, 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 or believe. Many imagine that to be a Muslim or white or gay or European is to accept a particular package of values and beliefs and ideals. To understand the politics of identity is really to understand why politics has become circumscribed by identity, something that I'll briefly touch on later. The second point I want to make is that the roots of identity politics lie not on the left, as many argue, but on the reactionary right. It developed in the late 18th and 19th centuries out of the counter-enlightenment, and its primary expression was in the concept of race. It was not called identity politics then, but that's what it was. The concept of racial type, as it developed through the 19th century, was of a group of people linked by a set of fundamental characteristics and differing from each other by, by um, other types by virtue of those characteristics. And such characteristics included not just mental and physical traits, but social needs and aspirations and values. One's being, one's identity, determined one's moral and social place in the world. And here was the original politics of identity. And it came to apply not just to racially defined groups, but to many other social groups, women, gays, particular cultures and nationalities and so on, who had their rights and dignity circumscribed because of what was deemed to be their identity. Where reactionaries adopted a particular outlook, radicals challenging identity, inequality and oppression, did so in the name of universal rights. They insisted that equal rights belong to all and that there existed a set of values and institutions under which all humans best flourished. It was the universalism that fueled the great radical movements that have shaped the modern world from the almost forgotten but hugely important Haitian Revolution of 1791 to the anti-colonial and anti-imperialist struggles of the 20th century to the movement for women's suffrage to the battles for gay rights. There are problems, of course, with the concept of universalism, universalism and in particular the way that it's been deployed, particularly as a cover for racism or bigotry. But all these struggles, all these great struggles that shaped the modern world, were struggles against the reactionary politics of identity and it is the loss of or disenchantment with the universalist perspective that it seems to me underlies contemporary identity politics. And this leads to my third point, how in the post-war world the relationship between the left, right and the politics of identity transformed. For it was only in the post-war world that what we now call identity politics came into being in the way that it has. For many radicals, as I've suggested, universalism came to be seen as a Eurocentric, 
even racist outlook, and one that silenced minority voices. In the 1960s, the New Left and New Social Movements drew upon thinkers such as Franz Fanon, for instance, to develop new forms of organisations and ideals. The struggle for black rights in America in particular was highly influential in developing ideas both of identity and of self-organisation, squeezed between an intensely racist society on the one hand and on the other a left often indifferent to their plight. Many black activists seeded from integrated civil rights movements and set up separate black groups. Many began to argue that African Americans had to organise separately, not just as a political strategy, but also as a cultural necessity. It is, as the black power activist Julian Lester put it, the recognition of all those things uniquely ours which separates ourselves from the white man. Black radicalism provided a template for many other groups, women, Native Americans, Muslims, gays, to look upon social change through the lens of their own cultures, goals and ideals. And here lay the seeds of what we now call identity politics. But contemporary identity politics is very different from the social movements of the 1960s. And this takes me to the fourth point, that today's identity politics is the product of the disintegration of the old solidarity movements. In the 60s and 70s, specific struggles for equality were inextricably attached to the wider project of social transformation. But a key shift over the past half century has been the disintegration of those wider social movements and radical struggles. Labour movement organisations have weakened. New social movements have disintegrated, as indeed as much of the left. And as the old social movement and radical struggles lost influence, so the recognition of identity became not a means to an end, but an end in itself. As the political philosopher Wendy Brown has put it, what we have come to, identi what we have come to call identity politics is partly dependent upon the demise of a critique of capitalism. Through these changes, the meaning of belongingness and of solidarity transformed. Politically, the sense of belonging to a group or collective has historically been expressed in two broad forms, through the politics of identity and the politics of solidarity. The former, the politics of identity, stretches, stresses attachments to common identities based on such categories as race, nation on the right, or gender, or culture on the left. The politics of solidarity draws people into a collective, not because of a given identity, but in pursuit of specific political and social goals. It's the politics of solidarity that has crumbled over the past two decades as radical movements have declined. For many today, the only form of collective politics that seem possible is that rooted in identity. Solidarity, therefore, has become increasingly defined less in political terms as in terms of ethnicity or culture or sexuality. Pe the questions people ask themselves is not so much in what kinds of society do I want to live as who are we. The two questions are, of course, intimately related, and any sense of social identity must answer both. But as the political sphere has narrowed, as the mechanisms for political change have eroded, so the answer to the question, in what kind of society do I want to live, has become shaped less by the kinds of values or institutions people want to establish than by the kind of people that they imagine they are. And the answer to who are we has become defined less by the kinds of society we want to create than by the history and heritage to which we supposedly belong. The frameworks through which we make sense of the world today are defined less as liberal or conservative or socialist than as Muslim or white or English or European. The fifth point 
is that the same trends that have transformed the 60s social movement into contemporary politics of identity have also helped rehabilitate white identity. As culture and identity, rather than class and politics, have become the lens through which we see social issues. And as the politics of identity have taken increasingly centre stage, so the far right has seized the opportunity to resurrect the original reactionary politics of identity. The identitarian movements of the far right have linked a reactionary politics of identity rooted in hostility to migrants and Muslims, to economic and social policies that were once a staple of the left, defence of jobs, support for the welfare state, opposition to austerity. And the result is a new kind of mass politics and the refashioning of the original reactionary politics of identity for a new age. Through the normalisation of white identity, and it is normalised if you look at the way that liberals and, and academics even write about the defence of uh, white identity and, and, and the rightness of the defence of right ide white identity. Through the normalisation of white identity, racism has acquired new legitimacy. One of the consequences of the mainstreaming of identity politics is that racism has become rebranded as white identity. And having spent decades promoting the politics of identity, the left finds itself in a weak position from which to challenge the identitarian right. Sixth, sixth point is that the categories of identity that we often celebrate are as much imposed as self-chosen. The politics of identity is a demand for recognition, but recognition of what? In this 1946 essay, Anti-Semite and Jew, Jean-Paul Sartre suggested that the notion of the authentic Jew was created by the anti-Semite. In anti-Semitic societies, he argued, Jews are forced to choose between self-effacement or caricatured self-identities, pretending to be something else than they were, or adopting the social stereotype of being Jewish. The French novelist and filmmaker Karim Miske draws on Sartre to make the same point about Muslim identities in France today, that it is a way that society treats those of North African origin that creates the idea of the authentic Muslim and indeed of the Muslim community itself in France. What in France today, he asks, unites the pious Algerian retired worker, the atheist French Mauritarian director that I am, the Fulani Sufi bank employee from Mont la Jolie, the social worker from Burgundy who has converted to Islam, and the agnostic male nurse who has never set foot in his great grandparents' home in Algeria. What brings us together, if not for the fact that we live within a society which thinks of us as Muslim? Of the five million or so French citizens in North Africa, of North African origin, just 40% think of themselves as observant Muslims, and only one in four attend Friday prayers. Yet, Miskes observes, all are looked upon by French politicians, policy makers, intellectuals, journalists as Muslims. And such labelling is part of the process by which the state casts the citizens as the other, as not really part of the French nation. We should defend the right of Muslims to identify as they wish, but that's different from defending a Muslim identity as a useful starting point for opposing racism or defending the rights of those of North African origin in France. And this leads to the seventh point. Who speaks or should speak for an identity community? Part of the problem of identity politics, it seems to me, is that it imposes certain conditions on what voices can be seen as authentically belonging to a community. When the US rapper Kanye West expressed his support last year for Donald Trump and suggested that slavery had been a choice, he was condemned for what he said, which was idiotic and reactionary 
But he was condemned not just for what he said, but for the fact that he was a black man saying it. His was an act of betrayal of the black community, indeed of his very blackness. West wrote the essays uh, Tandahisi Coates, was attempting to escape the black community and black history and be not black. And many on the left have long seen right-wing blacks or gays or women as traitors to the cause. Now, that seems to me an inevitable consequence of identity perspective, and it's also deeply reactionary. I mean, it may be comforting to imagine that if black people are being reactionary, it's, then they're not really black, or at least they're trying to escape being black by espousing a white idea of freedom. But is it really less reactionary to imagine that ideas come colour-coded than it is to claim that slavery was a choice? Or any more progressive to insist that West is not black because he backs Donald Trump than it is to see Trump as a brother? If blacks or gays or women are required to be left-wing to be authentically of their identity, for Muslims, it's usually the reverse. Liberal Muslims are often seen by many on both left and right as not being real Muslims, while the most conservative voices get celebrated as community leaders, the authentic voices of their communities. And here's the irony, that what I, the identity perspective often does is to restrict rather than expand the range of voices that can be heard by defining only certain voices as authentic. A way of limiting dissent, whether reactionary or radical. A way of imagining identity communities as homogenous and fixed. It's important that we hear the voices of those who are often excluded from public debate. But expanding the range of voices is not the same as defining people by their supposed identity group. Nor is it the case that we should listen to a voice simply because they are of a particular identity group. I would rather have someone speak up for me or represent me who has the same values as I do, but is of a different skin colour or faith or culture, than someone and someone who's never experienced racism, for instance, than someone who is of the same ethnicity or culture, who knows what racism is, but whose values and ideals are different from mine. <laughs> the, po the politics of identity turns on its head the relationship between one's being and one's values. It begins with one's being and suggests that only certain values fit that being. In reality, we should begin with the values and allow those values to shape our being. Finally, and most importantly, challenging injustice and inequality requires us also to challenge the social and economic frameworks that buttress inequality and injustice. Otherwise, justice comes to be seen not as the erasure of exploitative social structures, but merely as the possibility of greater fairness within those structures. And that's a problem with contemporary identity politics. From the perspective of identity politics, as the American, African-American academic and activist Adolf Reed Jr. has observed, a society in which 1% of the population controlled 90% of the resources could still be just, provided that roughly 12% of the 1% were black, 12% were Latino, 50% were women, and whatever appropriate proportions were LBGT people. In other words, this is why the more aggressively, he adds, working people of all races, genders, and sexual orientations have their protections dismantled and their lives broken, the louder and more insistent are the demands from the identitarian left that the crucial injustices in society should be understood in the language of ascriptive identity. That's the inevitable consequence of separating recognition from social transformation. In viewing exploitation primarily in identitarian terms, the reality of inequalities become obscured. 
reframing political and economic issues as cultural ones or as issues of identity makes it harder to challenge both discriminatory policies and economic exploitation. The debate about identity politics is not about whether we should challenge oppression, but about how we should do so. Many of us who criticise identity politics do so from the perspective of having challenged oppression and injustice for most of our adult lives. We recognise, however, that to challenge oppression and injustice requires us also to challenge the politics of identity, not to embrace it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, a lot of food of thought, food for thought, um, a lot of nuancing as well, and there are loads of questions in my head at least uh, that I would like to ask. We've got limited time, so I would like to, to, to limit it to a couple of questions. Um, one thing that I would like to, to focus on as well is that you'd rather have somebody uh, who's not part of the minority group to speak for you, but you share with the same, you share the same ideas. I'm paraphrasing here. Yeah. Um, what I wonder, because that discussion is happening a lot, how can you distinct um, somebody who shares the same ideas and uh, ideological views from somebody who has, you know, somebody who's been categorized as being paternalistic or, or suffering from the Messiah syndrome, so to speak. How do you distinct that difference? I, they, they may well do, but, but the point is that what matters to me is that if we want to fight racism, for instance, mm -hmm. there are certain ways I think that's important to fight racism and certain ways that aren't. Mm -hmm. It's important to me that whoever speaks, um, whether on my behalf or with me or on my platform, thinks the same way as I do about racism. Yeah. It's immaterial to me what skin colour they are, or what culture, or what faith. What matters is that, is that, is that they think the same way as me. Hmm. Um, and I think the argument that because they are white and arguing the same way as me, they're being paternalistic, mm -hmm. that seems to me a really regressive argument. Mm -hmm. there, are pater <laughs> there are people who are paternalistic, mm -hmm. that's true, but I think we are wise enough, all of us, to recognise that when it comes. We're also wise enough to recognise when people are, are, have the same values Right. And ideals and politics as we do. But if you want to battle, um, you know, so, uh, systems in, in systems in society, um, and having a seat at the table, isn't it frustrating at times that somebody who is white who shares the same value as you is being invited to talk on behalf of you instead of you? Uh, well, I, I don't see why it should be instead of me. I mean, I mean, no, because I, that I, happens. I would, I, I, what we see, the, 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 I, th I don't think we should confuse two different debates. Uh -huh. what, the one debate is, should we have platforms that are representative of the society in which we live? Yes, mm. we should. Yeah. The second ar argument is that should someone speak against racism only because he or she has suffered racism? Mm -hmm. The answer is no. I would far rather... Have, as I've said before, have someone speak against racism who's never suffered racism, but who thinks the same way as I do about combating racism, and someone like Kanye West, for instance, uh -huh. who has suffered racism, but thinks entirely different than, from the way I do yeah. about how to combat it. But that's the, that, in, indeed, Kanye West is the, the other side of the spectrum. And final question before I let you go. Um, isn't it the case that somebody who suffered racism knows far better how the experience is and knows far better how to voice that um, experience of racism than somebody who hasn't experienced that and has watched it from the outside. Yeah, but, but there's so a difference. So doesn't that, that, that mean there's that, that it's... But, but, but there's a difference between saying, I know what it's like to experience racism and saying, I know w how to combat it. Right. There are two... The politics... Experience is important. Mm. And my... Politics comes in out, partly out of my experiences. Mm. So do all of us. But my politics also, if my politics only came out of my experiences, mm -hmm. then there would be a problem. It is precisely because I'm able to go beyond 
all of us are able to go beyond our experiences, yeah. that we're able to engage in politics. Politics is about going beyond our narrow experiences and putting those experiences in a wider framework. That's why we need to distinguish between experience and politics. Right. When it comes to experience, I agree with you. Mm. you know, somebody who has experienced racism knows what it's like. Somebody who hasn't, has no idea what it's like. That's absolutely true. But that's not the same as saying that therefore they know how to combat it mm. or what politics we need, um, that's a very different argument. Right. Thank you so much. Kim and Malik. Well, now I would like to invite the panel on stage. I will introduce them all uh, one by one to you. Uh, our first panelist has worked uh, for more than 30 years predominantly on violence against women, race, faith and gender, and human rights. She co-edits the book Moving in the Shadows, which examines violence experienced by minor minority women and girls in the UK. That's among other things. She's also a fellow of the Muslim Institute. Please give a warm hand to Yasmin Rahman. <laughs> Please have a seat. Our next panelist moved to Australia at the age of 19 and was exposed to the big white world other than his hometown of Lahore, Pakistan. Uh, and that eventually led him away from Islam. He's the writer of the book, The Curse of God. Please give a warm hand to Harris Sultan. Well, nothing. Our next guest is a freelance journalist, writer, and activist, and she's a long-standing member of South Hall Black Sisters, and an, uh, an advocacy and campaigning group for women escaping domestic violence. She's chair of the Nihal Armstrong Trust, which funds families of children with cerebral palsy to buy cutting-edge equipment and services. Her articles are published in The Guardian, a New Humanist, a New Internationalist, and Open Democracy, amongst other magazines, journals, and websites. Please give a warm to Rahili Gap and our final guest grew up in, our, in a traditional Pashtun family in London. As an LGBT ex-Muslim Muslim activist, he is committed to unbridling the reins of patriarchy on gays and women of Muslim heritage. He's a spokesperson for the Council of Ex-Muslims in Britain, and he's also a spokesperson for Faith to Faithless, and Jimmy is also the resident life coach at Free Hearts, Free Minds. Please give a warm hand to Jimmy Bengai. <laughs> Welcome to all. Did I forget anything within the introductions that I gave? Something you would like to add? No. No? Okay. <laughs> Very warm well. welcome to you all. I will give you some water to start off with. And, well, oopsie. I'd just like to say that um, after Ken and Malik, we should just go home. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing else to add. Oh, but that would be a pity, actually, because your point of view is, is very interesting. Um, and we'd like to share that. Um, let's start with Rahila. Uh, you're a long-standing member of the South Hall Black Sisters. And what do they do, and why is it called that? OK, well, that's an interesting question, uh, especially in terms of the question of identity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so South Hall Black Sisters, uh, as you said in your introduction, is a group that's been supporting, advocating for women who've uh, of now black women, so Asian, African, Caribbean. Uh, and today, uh, we would say, you know, the, the bureaucratic term would be B-A-M-E or B-A-M-E-R, which is uh, black, um, asylum seeker, ethnic minority, refugee, right? So all these kind of, uh, to make sure that it's totally inclusive. Right. Uh, but basically, um, so, so we advocate for them and we uh, campaign and we bring about uh, policy and legal changes uh, uh, in the field, uh, to, especially to do with immigration and domestic violence. Um, and when uh, South Hall Black Sisters was set up in 1979, uh, we were very much uh, a part of a politics which came out of the um, colonial struggles. So uh, the, in, 
throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s when um, there were countries getting their national independence from uh, Britain and other colonial countries, uh, a lot of the supportive um, groups uh, fighting for that independence were based in Britain. Mm -hmm. And there was an umbrella, a, a, a recognition that together they fought a common colonial struggle mm -hmm. and that uh, and they were grouped under the term black. And we also have um, a theorist, uh, a race theorist who is now dead, uh, Sivanandan, who talked in terms of black being a political color. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, um, uh, that, that was very much part of our politics. And in fact, what is interesting, um, and, and I just want to bring in a personal element here, which is that when I came to England, I came at the age of 19, um, and I identified as Indian because I had, that was my identity. But when I became politically active, I chose to be identified as black, mm -hmm. as a way of recognizing that we needed to move outwards and not close in on ourselves. Um, and so it, to me, it's quite a, so, so what, so to really to, um, in some ways, uh, reinforce what, what Kenan was saying, was that actually, you know, it's not, it's also a choice. What do you choose? It's not just given. You can, mm -hmm. I'm born, I'm a born Hindu, but I, I hate that identity. I would never publicly, well, I am just about to say that I was born Hindu, but I wouldn't, don't want to identify as a Hindu, and, and particularly today with what's going on in Modi, And especially is India. by other people as well. And, uh, and, yeah. and because it started, uh, the organization started out a while ago, how does a new generation of women would like to be identified? Is it still in the same way or not? Well, this is, it's a big debate, and I, I, some, I think it's actually become worse. Because in the old days, when you said you were black, uh, it actually was a short uh, cut to your politics. So Asians who would, you know, who didn't want to, who wanted to be anything but black, mm. would recognize, where, would say, why do you want to call yourself black? Um, and then Africans and Caribbeans who held black as an identity that belonged just to themselves would also want to deny you membership of the black community. Mm. I think it's become worse. I mean, I think it was somewhat aggravated by the funding policies, um, you know, and so we then began to identify as a, first Asian and African Caribbean, then uh, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, and then Hindu Muslim, mm. you know. Um, so, and I think that's a very reactionary and retrograde step. Mm -hmm. but, but, but what should be the step? forward in order to, should, should we still define ourselves by our ethnicity? I mean, is that a, stre is, is that a, a strength or like Kinnan also said, it's some, something that's been added by, by the outside world in some cases? Yeah, I mean, if, if there's one big point that I would like to make about identity politics is that I think uh, it, it is, uh, often is the starting point of radical politics but it shouldn't be the end point. Right. It, should be the tr it can be the trigger, but it should not be the goal. I think that's a cul-de-sac. Right. I think that's where we have problems. Thank you. For now. <laughs> Yasmin, a um, question for you as well. As a human rights activist, you've come across um, a, a lot of cases in which uh, the human rights of some groups weren't respected. And um, this is also the case for women of color, right? Yeah. Um, and in what ways are you trying to change that situation? Um, gosh, that's a huge question. <laughs> I know. Um, well, I've, been, I've been a human rights activist for as long as I can remember. Um, you know, I followed in the footsteps of, of my father who um, was very active on the anti-racist scene in the UK. Um, so I think, you know, working, being a part of the women's movement from a young age and then working as a frontline worker, like Rahila said, working for Southwell Black Sisters, I head up a women's organisation um, in the Midlands, in England, um, and doing that work with uh, women who are experiencing domestic violence, sexual violence, who are trafficked, um, who are trapped in domestic servitude. So we offer a range of services to them as, as an organisation, but I think there's also... Um, 
writing and being political and being part of debates and raising the issues that impact upon um, all women. Mm. So making sure that we're raising the specificities that impact upon um, women of, of immigrant backgrounds. And what are um, those specificities? But also the commonalities. Yeah, exactly, because I, I can imagine that if women are in an abusive situation, yeah. does, it, does it matter, I wonder, does it matter whether they're of colour, whether they're black or whether they're white? I think it does, because I think the patriarchy manifests itself in so many different ways. Um, and the justifications for that exertion of male power and male control um, mm. you know, is used in, in very different ways. So um, whilst you may have a, a white woman who is experiencing physical violence from a man who thinks he um, you know, should hold the power in the family, will have that commonality with, with her, her non-white sister, but it's the use of culture, it's the use of religion, it's the use of tradition and rules like we heard in, in the film earlier, which I think there needs to be an understanding of and mm. where I guess um, in some families you've had that move towards the nuclear family and the perpetrator will be just the husband. Mm. Um, where we've got um, families from minority backgrounds, you've also got multiple perpetrators or potentially multiple perpetrators. Um, and, you know, I mean, like I said, the patriarchy will use any justification it can find in order to, um, you know, retain its, its superior position. Right, the cultural justification, yeah. So, yeah. so to speak. Jimmy, you agreed on that. Would you like to add on that as well? So I don't think many people know this, but like I, uh, well, the second part of what I'm going to say. So the first part is I grew up in a Pakistani house in um, London in a, in a South Asian community, and there was a lot of domestic violence in my house, actually, and it was directed towards my mother and sometimes my sisters. Um, and I was really struggling as a child to, to make sense of what was happening in my house. How is this violence taking place? And the community isn't intervening. Uh, the police, when they come, don't seem to be doing anything, but are treating it as a family sort of matter. And then I think at the age of 18 or 19, God knows how this book landed in my lap, which was called Against the Grain, and it was by um, Southall Black Sisters. And I remember reading this book, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is what is happening in my house. Like when it started talking about honor culture and the way that my sister's and my mum's behavior um, was reflecting uh, on the whole community at large, but particularly on uh, my brothers and on my dad. Um, and I think just to link back to what you were saying, in that actually that, that, that concept of honor culture is very different to something you would find within our white counterparts. It would be absence from, uh, from, from their dialogue. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's, really, it's really important to have this focus on just our uh, groups because there are some very definite distinctions mm -hmm. in terms of how and why things manifest. Right. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming an LGBTQ activist? So I think before I was a, a I, I guess I see myself more as a human rights activist rather than just LGBT rights. Um, and because of the, the environment I grew up with, my human rights activism was really based around what is happening with women in my community. As I stepped more and more into my sexuality, uh, there were some commonalities actually there that um, also bring my human rights activity into the LGBT community. So one of these is... Not to cut you off, but just, just a quick, quick question. How did you know that that pattern that you witnessed at home, that, that for you wasn't the norm or that, you had, that that was something you had to rebel against because it was something that you grew up in? Where did you find that um, insight that it was something that you couldn't agree against with? Against the grave. Yeah, against <laughs> the, the grain. Was it, was it so because of I the think book? before against the grain, uh, as a child, you know, looking at the treatment of my brothers and myself compared to what my sisters and my mum were allowed to do, mm. there was this huge disparity between the way that me and my brothers could go out and come home compared to my sisters. Uh, where, where, where are you going? What time are you going to be back? Are there going to be any boys there? Uh, the, 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 the boys in my family went to mixed uh, schools. My sisters had to go to all-girls schools. Did your brothers notice that as well? Um, yes, they seemed less bothered by it than I was. I think maybe you either accept this is just the way things are, um, or maybe you rebel against it and you think you know it's a, it's a real injustice. Hmm. I, I think also, depending on how much you're probably reading as a kid as well and what sorts of stuff you're reading, hmm. will influence the way that you uh, challenge injustice or accept it as this is just the way it is. So, for example, I'd ask questions like, how comes 
my sister can't do this, and I'd be given a response, because she's a girl. And I'd be waiting for the rest of that sentence, <laughs> and then realized, oh my god, that's your visa, and it's like, just because she's a girl, and then you've put a full stop there. Hmm. Um, and my brothers would be satiated by that uh, explanation, and then began using that as, a, as an explanation as well. And the other thing, the real disparity as well that I saw was, my sisters weren't hijabis, like nobody in my house wore a hijab but there was a definite policing of what they wore. Like their clothing would have to be uh, covering their body. Mm. And nobody ever really paid attention to what I wore or what my brothers wore. Mm. So this sense of injustice was what got me thinking more critically. And then against the grain and um, mm. yeah, any such feminist narratives really made me see what was happening in my house and how. And that, had, that had a commonality as well with you uh, realizing your sexuality. And, and what happened from there on? Did you yeah. uh, express your sexuality within the family right away, or did you, how did you go about it? Yes, yeah, so I think, uh, so my family found out I was gay when I was about 23, and I got disowned for about 10 years. Um, but I think, just to give you an example, I think we, sometimes we can get quite intellectual. So to maybe bring it to a, spe a specific example is, I've been spending a lot of time with the concept of shame at the moment, and how when I was growing up, you know, and I, I'd ask about, what, is it okay to be gay or is it not okay to be gay? Uh, and you might ask in the mosque or you might ask a family member uh, and you'd always be hit back or well, Islam says no and actually gay people should be executed under Sharia law. Uh, and then there'd be an entire dialogue about how to kill the gay person, like should you decapitate him, should you hang him, should you stone him, should you burn him? You know, that was quite a fringe um, perspective. Uh, so there was this whole conversation about how to kill gay people and, and this internalized shame started taking place. But now, as a, as a man who set steps more and more into uh, the pride of being a, a gay man and actually uh, my authentic self and living with integrity and mm -hmm. embracing who I am, the shame that was directed at me mm -hmm. by my community is now directed towards my family even more. Mm -hmm. So as I escape from the confines of shame, yeah. it's still impacting me because my mother is made to feel ashamed that her son is so proud of being who he is. Mm. And when I look at that experience of shame and I look for commonalities within my community, what I see is that women who try to live an independent life within my community, women who decide, actually, I don't want to get married and I just want to live by myself, or I want to date, or I want to choose my own husband, or I want to have sex before marriage, that same web of shame mm. is the one that ensnares them and right. so we have this common experience of shame. Right. Uh, it's just directed at us by the wider community. But how do you deal that on a practical level? I mean, do you connect mm. with them and do you don't connect with them at all? Yeah, I think so. I think conversations like this are really important because actually, um, and, and this was about, ties into the conversation about identity politics, is often that can be a narrowing and a, 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 a decreasing size of identity, like actually you're not a gay man so you can't speak about shame in this way. But actually what I'm more interested in is uh, collaboration mm. and looking at actually, this is my experience of shame, what is that experience like for you as a, uh, as a, a woman of Muslim heritage? Mm. Or what is it like for you as a, a gay man who is white? Mm. What was your experience of shame? And I think if we use identity politics in that way where we're looking for collaboration and commonality mm. and we're building bridges, um, and I think it, historically it was used in that way, that's a great way to use it. Mm. However, I think there is, uh, there is an ability to misuse any tool. So if we think about identity politics as a tool, and then we look at how it's being misused, I can give you a couple of hideous examples. So Gita mentioned the Inclusive Mosque Initiative yesterday, uh, which is like an LGBT-friendly uh, mosque. They include everybody in their, uh, in their practice. And so a bunch of ex-Muslims thought on Eid will go down to uh, their event and show solidarity and support. Bad idea, I don't know who came up with that idea. It might have been me. So, um, <laughs> so we went down there and the opening, uh, the, the female Iman who opened the talk said, if you're a white man, consider your privilege and how much space you're taking up here. And there were white men in, in, in the room. Uh, and then after the prayer, the a lady who did the khutbah, like the sermon, she mentioned white men about three times in really disparaging and quite frankly racist ways. And, uh, and you know, it was quite abhorrent to be sat there watching somebody just criticizing uh, white males, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, 
And so after, after that, we spoke to the lady who gave the, the sermon, and we said, to her, actually, that was really quite uncomfortable. And uh, it just seems like you're targeting one group of people in, in the room. Uh, and she didn't really have a, a way to, to combat that. And we pointed out that actually, as a, as a gay-friendly mosque, you're holding your event in the basement of a hotel. And the reason you're doing that is not because of white men, but really because of brown men. So if you tried to hold your event in a mosque, mm -hmm. the violence and intimidation with which you'd be met because of brown men would lead you to have to call the police, mm -hmm. and it would be white policemen who would be defending you against those brown men. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to give you... I want to give you two quick examples. Can, 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 I, can I just get into that, just to be devil's advocate? Because yeah. I, 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 I totally hear what you're saying. But isn't this um, opposition against white men and uh, against the patterns that they represent? It's not about their individuality, but the patterns they represent. Isn't that a necessary phase in emancipation? So you have to um, direct your um, activism towards a certain group in order to find the strength. It's not maybe very nuanced but it's a necessary step. Uh, again, devil's advocate, how would you react so to that? I agree, it's, it's not nuanced, and I wouldn't say, I, and I'd suggest it's unnecessary. I think actually what you need to do is establish the universality of human rights that you're committed to, and then we all get included in that conversation to achieve those rights. Hmm. So I don't care. <laughs> We haven't got time for this, guys. Like, there's so many of us. So um, thank you, but thank you. So, um, so I don't care, as the speaker said prior to me, I don't care if you're a white man, but actually, uh, if you're committed towards my rights as a gay man within the Muslim community and wider society, that's all that matters to me. And let's fight for those rights together. Yeah. I want to give you two really can quick I, examples. Can we do that a little bit later? Okay. Because okay. Harris hasn't been speaking at all yet. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I can Sorry, I'm really talk. Am I up? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're up, you're up. No, you, you, you consider yourself to, to, to be an atheist, but I'm also very curious, how was your journey? How did you get to that point? I mentioned in your introduction, you went to Australia when you were 19. But yeah. what Really? Well, it was a pretty long one. I, I wrote a book on that. Um, I, it's the, I mean, I, 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 I was, I, I always had the, not the emotional issues with that. Like, I mean, a lot of people, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I always had the philosophical problems with the concept of God. And now when I ran into a lot of so many other ex-Muslims and they're all, and I had thought for a moment that maybe I'm this nine-year-old genius who's come up with a, you know, this amazing question that no one else before me came up with. And I've spoken to a lot of people, and they all come up with the same thing, like, you know, who created God and everything created God. And my parents would tell me everything. So it never made sense to me, and I would look at the night sky, and, you know, the stars were just like, this universe just seemed so big. So, and then later on in my life, I started looking into, I ran into Richard Dawkins' books and his lectures and videos and looked him up more and then I discovered Hitchens and so many others and then, yeah, I think I was probably 22, 23 when I, when I became an atheist and uh, then I studied Quran specifically because I still had to go back to Islam, which was my supposed to be religion. Um, and um, yeah, then it just became more and more problematic and there was moral issues, there are scientific issues, and obviously the philosophical problems exist for every god. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was like I became an atheist for, a, I was an atheist for a very long time. And then I came out as an ex-Muslim uh, in 2017 when something in Pakistan happened. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, again, like my family was okay. They didn't care too much about um, me being an atheist. I mean, I'm sure they were disappointed, and but they didn't mind. Um, and uh, then there was the student who was killed in, he, by a mob in Pakistan. That kind of angered me a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of, I could relate myself to him that this could have been me, but I'm just lucky that I'm living in Australia. Everything's fine. And then Ayaz's army was arrested. Um, again, he was a blogger and he was just criticizing mm -hmm. Islam. And um, I thought, this is it. I think we, we, we need to come out. We need to speak about it, especially the ones who live in safer countries. Um, we, 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 we need to speak out and then maybe we can make it easier for all the others. And then I just, then yeah, so, I met so many ex-Muslims in Pakistan. But, but um, being in, stating you're an atheist is already quite a statement, so to speak. Um, why the need to state that you're an ex-Muslim? So it, it well, see, the ex-Muslim term, like, I mean, I, I, I use that only for its utility. And I, I remember seeing Mariam 
I think it was 2006 or seven, um, where she was standing, it was a BBC program, and, and I saw Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. At that point, I was identifying myself as an atheist. Mm. Um, again, because at that point, it was Dawkins and Hitchens' time, and then, okay, mm. that's it, I'm hanging out with these guys. <laughs> um, but, 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 but then I'm like, okay, I can relate to this more. And it's, it was just amazing. But again, like it just went away for a moment. And I, I still didn't, because I wasn't out publicly. So I wasn't going out mm. to shops and telling, hey, I'm ex-Muslim. So there was no need to use that. But when I did come out, then, then I had to, I mean, that, that's what I can relate to. Again, like I'm not a fan of identity politics in that sense. But mm. I agree with Rahila that it is an initial step. And then it shouldn't be the end point. Mm. And hopefully we can all live in a place where we're all equal, where we just don't need to identify with anything, yeah. except for just we're, we're earthlings maybe, and then yeah. we can include the environment and the animals and yeah. the, everything in that group. And, <laughs> and, and but, but also, um, by the state, well, what, let's fra rephrase it. Um, friends of mine who've been in, born into Muslim families here uh, feel the force in society whenever something bad happens committed by a Muslim or, or, or something associated with the religion, they feel that there's a pressure for them to take a distance from uh, the, the religion, even though they're not practicing Muslims. Um, do you feel that um, because you speak out as an ex-Muslim, uh, and you, you, can, uh, you, you speak out against those actions, that you um, enhance the pressure on the other group of Muslims or Muslim bomb people in order to take a step back from that society. And to finalize the question, suddenly they are being seen as a representation of a whole religion, and because of that, they're erased from their individuality. Yeah, well, and, and this is one of the biggest drawbacks of identity politics, that when we, when we there's this innate desire in our psyche that we want to be, we, we want to create tribes, we, we want to have this, these broad identifiers that are identifying us, but at the same time we want to be treated as individuals. Mm. I mean, the, if you want to be treated as, as an individual, the only identity you need is just your face and your name. Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, if, we, if, you, if, you, if you want to be lumped together with other big group of people, for example, if you're a Muslim, 1 1.345 billion people, then you are somehow yourself relating to all these people. All of a sudden, if you say, I'm a Muslim, then so is Osama bin Laden, so, so, is, so is Baghdadi, and so is everyone. So they create the pressure on them. We, as act uh, activists, and I can speak for myself, and I'm sure a lot of my colleagues here, we do everything we can to try to differentiate Muslims and Islam. All the Muslims, I think Muhammad Said is probably here, and I heard him say that most Muslims are actually better than Islam. So our criticism remains on Islam, and then we can see some problems that spring out of Islam, and that infl they infect certain individuals, and as a result, we see all these activities that we see. And, mm. um, but, but, but like Kenan also said, there is not one Muslim or one interpretation of Islam. Um, there's a whole variety, the, the example he uses uh, in France, from France, I mean, that, that shows that there's a whole variety. When you say you're an ex-Muslim, do, don't you feed into that same same categorization of, 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 a, of a whole different, differentiated group of people. Yeah, but I, I, I agree that there are different interpretations of Islam, but I don't agree that all the other interpretations are actually correct. Hmm. So Muhammad would have meant just one interpretation. He was one man, he was, everything was his invention. Yes, he made up things as he went along. When he, went, when he wanted to marry his daughter-in-law, he just said, oh, I heard something. God wants me to marry her. So, so we, can, we can draw a good idea of his psyche. So, so he, scholars who have studied, and again, scholars don't agree with what interpretation as well. These multiple hundreds of interpretations come out of that. Mm. And, and, and that, that is the problems I see as, as, as for the Islamic scholars, that is, Islamic apologists to defend. We, the Islam that I can see and the Islam that other people can see, we, if the verse says that you can beat your wife or the verse says um, you, know, you can have four wives or sex slaves, whatever, that's what I'm going to take it. I'm not going to, it's not my job to sugarcoat it. And I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to make arguments for, for, for my Muslim mother, who's a wonderful woman, and, and say, sorry, mother, you know, he didn't mean sex slaves. He just meant, you know, if you just go out on a party and it meant something else, or whatever. I, it's not my job to do that. Mm. Um, and that's their job to do it. And, but we recognize that there are different Muslims, that the pe Muslims see Islam differently. There are different interpretations. So a lot of people, are, I, it's the, the sex slave part. I mean, for me, like it, 
I, 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 have, I might have overused it a few times, because that to me in this day and age sounds such a powerful thing that there's this man who's revealed. But aren't you cherry picking in that sense? Because all religions and all holy books, whatever they might mean, have those parts. By you know, highlighting that and repeating it time after time, you're feeding into a stereotype as well. Yeah, well, why, why shouldn't we cherry pick it? I mean, we shouldn't be able to find anything bad in Islam or in the Quran. We shouldn't be able to. No, no, have a nuance look, there, are very, there are bad things, there are good things as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but it's a no, combination. No, but the majority of people don't believe that there are bad things in that. So mm. you have to remind them there is a bad thing here, here, and here, mm. um, so, so so you need to. But then again, very very, uh, there, there's also a group of non-Muslims who believe that m Islam is only bad, and they use you as an excuse to prove their own point. So you're being misused in that sense. You can be mis misused in that sense. Well, I, I I don't know. Like I mean, I can't be, um, I, and I'm not going to let anyone. Or your statements are yeah, yeah. maybe being well, misused. Well, well, they can cherry pick or not, and that's why I, I love what Shabana did. We heard yesterday that she held up the Quran and she held up a big, huge matchstick. I don't know where she got that from, but... And, and she, she, she made people believe that she was about to burn the Quran, but she didn't do it to please those people who were going to use that clip. And hey, look, even these ex-Muslims are burning it because it's a, it's a horrible book. So you should burn it too and then build a narrative against Muslims. So she didn't do it, but she also got the point across. So, so yeah, I mean, we, you, you might want to come up with brilliant new ideas to do it. But, um, and yeah, we have brilliant people who are doing a great job. Thank you. Um, a question for you all. Um, how would you, because it is a program about identity, how would you all define yourself? How would you define yourself? Starting with you. Yeah, good question. Um, so uh, I think, how do I define myself? So I define myself of Muslim heritage. I definitely do define myself of, as of Muslim heritage. And I think I'm actually quite interested in broadening the definition of Muslim to include ex-Muslims. I think that's a really important thing to do because we literally live in the same houses. We're the, within the same communities. We're looking after the same parents and grandparents. And I think sometimes when, um, when we're engaging with people who are Muslim, because we define ourselves as ex-Muslim, they then move to this position of, well, you're an ex-Muslim, you don't get to have a conversation about what happens with women in hijab. You don't get to have a conversation with um, what happens within the Muslim community. So I think I define myself in many ways because my identity is multifaceted. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to my activism, I think it's important that people understand I am of Muslim heritage mm -hmm. and I do have experience around that mm -hmm. um, and uh, that I shouldn't be seen as separate to that community or outside of that community. Right. I sort of think I've answered that question in, in the sense that um, I guess um, I see myself as a black woman. Mm -hmm. um, I find that I have to explain that a lot more mm -hmm. uh, nowadays. Um, but I think um, I'd just like to sort of uh, take a little tangent from that question and say that you know, I've, just, uh, I've been following um, Assam, the northeastern state uh, in India, mm -hmm. where people are being asked to register and uh, particularly it's targeted at the Muslim community and they have to prove that they haven't, uh, that they've been in India since before 1971 when the Bangladesh war took place. Now this is part of a, a whole strategy by Modi to try and rid India of as many Muslims as possible. Now, at times like that, can you imagine how you have to hold on, you are pressurized to, you know, um, to an identity, to hold on mm. to an identity. I think that those are the sorts of um, pressures um, that you find in society that I think are really um, something to be fought against. So mm. what, what I'm saying is that in a sense, I can choose, I ch I, of course I choose uh, uh, a black woman identity because I, I know that I have to fight uh, sexism and misogyny in my own community and mm. I have to fight racism in the outside community. And what we have found, and you see, this is the other thing about politics and identity. You might find two black women um, who identify as black women in Britain, mm -hmm. um, and, we, and we might have totally different politics. Mm -hmm. So and I, just to give you a very specific example, um, you know, we've, at South Old Black Sisters, we've been um, looking at the issue of the immigration status of uh, women um, who are facing domestic violence. So if they are, um, you know, um, women who have been married to British uh, spouses and they've faced violence, um, they are threatened 
uh, with deportation. There are, and, and again, uh, the same thing with forced marriage, the British government has been using immigration policies to try and restrict uh, the is so-called in the name of trying to restrict the incidence of forced marriage. Mm. They're using immigration uh, tactics to reduce the number of people coming to this country. There are black women who actually encourage that. And we would say, well, actually, Im immigration uh, law is uh, dangerous to our entire community, mm. that it's an attack against everybody. Mm. So we mustn't use immigration in order to improve the, the, the prospect for black women or Asian women facing domestic violence. So what I'm trying to say is that that issue of nuance mm -hmm. is not necessarily located in identity. Mm -hmm. It may come out of your experience of identity, but it is in the kind of politics that you develop mm -hmm. and the understanding of where the attacks are coming from and how do you balance the different struggles. And has it been picked up by the black women uh, you've preaching, uh, you've been telling this, this to? No, I mean, there, so there are groups uh, in, in Britain who will, who will use immigration uh, policies. So there was, at one point, there was a um, proposal by the British government to uh, increase the age of foreign spouses mm. from 18 to 21, those who were getting married to British uh, mm. citizens, right? That was uh, d differential, it was discriminatory, it was only targeted mm. at people marrying foreign spouses, often uh, black communities, minority communities. But there were groups of um, black women who said that that was fine because it actually dealt with the issue of forced marriage. Mm. So, and what is your so, position on that? So our position was no, because it's discriminatory. Mm, yeah. um, and and all, not all forced marriages take place across uh, the ocean. Yeah, there yeah. are forced marriages that take place in Britain. Yeah. It was uh, the British government wanted to use a so-called human rights issue yeah. to um, further their racist immigration agenda. Yeah. And you have to be alive to that. You have to be alive to all the ways in which your particular battle is impinging on the rights of others. And I think what identity politics does is it can make you so inward looking yeah. that you're only looking you know, at your immediate issue and not how it impacts on someone else. Yeah, right. So that's... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Same for you as well. How would you define yourself, identify yourself? Oh, gosh. Um, if you'd asked me, I don't know, a few months ago, I probably would have said just a, just a human. Um, be, because, again, like, I, I want to get rid of as many titles that come with it as, as much as possible. But now, now, I don't know, probably need another one because I've noticed vegans are actually trying to wake us up to a point where now they're including more sentient beings and we, we, we are being told that we have to think for them as well and not just for ourselves. So, okay, as a, as you, you've been told that, okay, the team human will only work if we have, if we have alien attack. And then, then we would think that, okay, humanism tribe is big enough and it can accommodate everyone but otherwise we always need localized tribes okay we have this issue and you have that issue mm -hmm. and i got nothing against to the point that most of them are reactions um and um so uh, I, I wanted to go back to the point that where you made earlier about um would i would i worry about getting being used by the people who can i i want to remind people there was um uh, I actually ran for Senate in Australia um, a little while ago, and it was, um, oh, okay, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have run for it at that point. But anyway, the, I was told by someone, I was suggested to someone to, to run on a ticket of a, one of the right-wing parties, and I was suggested, okay, you, sh you should run with, un, under her party, and it might work. And I, um, point blank, I refused because of her views that I, everyone was familiar with. So. She might have thought about using me or not. Uh -huh. It's not that easy to get used. So, uh, or I wouldn't get e easily that used. But on the other flip side as well, if you remember that when Christchurch shooting happened, we had an Australian uh, right-wing, far-right uh, politician, Fraser Arning, and he made some horrible comments about Muslims and said Muslims should be banned wherever they go, even though they were victims at that point. Mm -hmm. and, they, and these Muslims should be banned wherever they go. There's trouble. So he, he, there was horrible comments, and the whole of Australia was shocked. So I started a petition against it, and it got 1.5 million 
signatures, and that was the biggest in Australia's history. And we managed to get him off. We managed to get him out of Senate. And even at that point, all the when people thought, oh, this guy, most of them were actually from Muslim world. And I got a lot of comments and likes on my, on my Facebook profile. And, but when they realized that, oh, hang on, this guy is actually an ex-Muslim. He doesn't like Islam. And I actually got attacked more by the, by the same people who were signing to, uh, so who were trying to support my petition. Mm. Um, so so it, it, it goes both ways. You, you, you could get attacked, but you just got to stick to your, your point, how you see the world, um, whether the right wing tries to use you or or, 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 or the people you're trying to um, raise the voice for or against their, mm. their beliefs, they will, they, will, they will still come after you. That's so. great. But, <laughs> thank you. But I guess it's still not an answer on the question how you, you I would identify yourself. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm thinking about it. I don't know. Can, can someone suggest something? <laughs> we're, Is we're, it that important? We're sentient beings. That's sentient it. beings. Yeah. Let's, sentient. Let's, stick, let's stick with that for now. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, the same question for you. How would you oh, God. define it? I don't know, because um, I've really struggled with this question, because um, I've been asked it a lot. Um, I, there are some groups that want to impose the label of Muslim on me. Um, I've sometimes used Muslim heritage, but my heritage is much more than my Muslim heritage. You know, I've got Punjabi heritage, I've got both Pakistani and Indian heritage, um, so which one do you pick? Um, um, so I think that, you know, this constant reductionism mm. is, is wearing after a while, but I think it goes back to what Kenan said about values. Um, so I would, I, I, you know, my feminism, I guess, is the absolute core of who I am. Um, I don't think you can be a woman and not be a feminist. Um, <laughs> but I think... Um, so black feminist, because again, you know, my political awakenings were during the 70s and 80s, that political term of black. But I have African Caribbean and African friends who were very exercised by my use of that. So, um, but yeah, feminist, anti-racist. Okay. Yeah, definitely secularist too. Yeah, they're the three that I would pick. Earthling. Earthling. Oh, I was just thinking about it. I'm an earthling. earthling. But, that, but that would only make sense to aliens if they do visit us. Exactly. <laughs> and it can excludes I, a lot as well. Um, can I, I we, just touch on that one point? Because it's such an important point that you raised with Harris about uh, our activities feeding people ammunition to throw at us. And I just want to say that that argument it's leveled at all, all of us. Mm -hmm. When Southall Black Sisters were raising awareness about domestic violence mm -hmm. in the South Asian community, and they were raising cases and, uh, and issues of South Asian women who were being battered by their husbands, mm -hmm. uh, South Asian men said, shut up, you're giving ammunition to white people, right. making us look barbaric. Yeah. When suffragettes were stepping into men's spaces, mm -hmm. other women said, shut up, you're giving fodder to make women look bad. When, um, even under colonialism in India, when we saw young people uprising against um, the, the, the white people, yeah. we saw parents saying, children, stop it, you're making us look bad. Mm -hmm. So often we're hit with this, your, your activity is giving ammunition to other people to be used against us, mm -hmm. but we have to move back to what is the universal human right commitment that we're striving for? Yeah. If there's something there, then actually we know that when we look back in history, that we're going to be looked at favorably. If there isn't something there in terms of universal human rights, yeah. then actually maybe you've got a point. Thank you. Can, Thank can you I so add much. something to that very quickly? <laughs> very quickly. Just the point that you've raised a couple of times about the victimization of Muslims. Yeah. And it, it's absolutely real. You know, there is anti-Muslim racism. But as a community, we're not the first community to face this. It happens to, you know, knife crime in, in Britain, the reports have, have gone internationally, and the way that um, African Caribbean communities are viewed. But where, where is the Muslim voice standing up and saying, that's also happening to that group as well as to us? It's mm. about racism. And I think, um, I think there's a perception that, um, certainly in the UK, that we've done race. We, we're in a post racial world and that's not true and, mm. I, and this sort of hierarchy of minority groups of somehow Islamophobia and anti-Semitism sit above other forms of racism. You either fight all of it or you get out of the way and let those of us who want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. 
so uh, we have to continue. So it, it's, it's about intersectionality and, and also solidarity as well. Those two are the core values in order to further the struggle. We will continue our uh, discussion, but I would like to introduce uh, a, a poet to you guys because it's time for an artistic in, 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 uh, insertion. Hmm, I don't know whether that's the right word to use. <laughs> Interlude, of course, it's an interlude. I think artistic I'm getting confused more, more and more. Okay, um, because uh, we're going to listen to Hamila Salat. Uh, she's a journalist, she's a poet, she's a feminist, a pro-LGBT and a new entrant into the ex-Muslim Af activism. Halima is from Somali, Kenyan uh, descent and living in the Netherlands and has recently come out publicly uh, with a lack of faith in Islam after nine years of living a double life. Uh, she doesn't believe that there's anything like and called Islamic feminism. She also despises anti-Muslim bigotry and is here to read a poem for us uh, with the same name uh, as this session. The poem is called On My Identity and is written especially for today. So please welcome Halima Salat. <laughs> So I wrote this poem uh, on my identity, uh, especially for this session. Um, and I will try and breathe first. <laughs> um, so, you simplify, exemplify, and ratify in an attempt to dignify. Vilify in a, a, oh, I just criticize. You exotify and then you go and fetishize. This is to dehumanize. It's to demonize in an attempt to compromise. It's simply shallow and ignorant and damn right narrow and arrogant. On my identity, all that makes me. The complex but non-conforming, the fluid and non-believing, the rapidly growing, constantly changing a million steps towards not one thing, but a million things. It's impossible to simplify. While I do not want to horrify you, I do want to amplify that. You've no idea what I have to nullify, no. On days that I'm horrified by your utter ignorance on my existence, on my identity, all that makes me, confronts me, discards me, and sometimes regards me. You? I'm not an expert on it. In fact, far from it. Sorry, you cannot think for me. No, thank you. I think I have saved myself. For me, it's my mind that is worth saving, and I think I already did that. Hmm. No, I am not your posting. Neither your constant giving. Neither your well meaning. In fact, I'm neither or none on my identity. The complex but non-conforming, the fluid and non-believing, the rapidly growing, the constantly changing a million steps towards not one thing, but a million things. With an alienated past and appropriated present, further humiliated by such narrow views. Newsflash. This is my narrative. This is my story. This is my identity. I, I, I am the expert on it. So you listen to me, damn it. This left, right, center, and in betweens, I do not play for any of these teams. If I were to choose a side, 
I will choose one called a fucking human being. Thank you so much. A fucking human being. I think, that, I think that's a title I would like to adopt as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Rila, just a, a quick uh, step to your travels. Uh, you went, in 2016, you went to Syria. C can you tell us why you were there? Yeah, I was there to um, research a book that I'm co-writing. Um, I think I'll be still co-writing it when I'm dead. Um, so it's been four years already. Anyway, so in 2016, um, I'd heard uh, a Kurdish um, uh, activist speak at a conference, and I just could not believe what he was saying. That, and, and this actually also links back to what people were saying in an earlier session about the Arab Spring, uh, that sense that in some ways it has been a failure and that it's been taken over by Islamists. This thing that I'm going to tell you about is actually one of the hidden success stories of the Arab Spring because it actually uh, was triggered by the Arab Spring in Syria uh, under Assad. There was you know, the civil resistance, which was very soon taken over by political Islamists and I think actually in, to some extent encouraged by Assad because he opened up the prisons uh, and let out all the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda type uh, people that he had imprisoned in order to justify then his violent heavy handedness against uh, the uprisings. Anyway, while he was actively involved in uh, the southern part of Syria, he more or less left north, north, the northeastern strip in Syria alone. And in some ways, the development of the Kurdish struggle and the Kurdish women's revolution that's taking place in that part of the world uh, exemplifies some of the things we've been saying about identity politics because, uh, and I need to give you a little bit of history in order for it to make sense. So, um, you know, it kind of harks back to colonialism, what doesn't. Um, the um, Sykes-Picot agreement between Britain and France led to a division of the Ottoman Empire. And so the Kurdish people were left stranded between four countries, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria. Um, and uh, the extent of discrimination and oppression that they faced in all of these countries uh, was different, but you know, very harsh. For example, in Turkey, you cannot use the letters Q, W, and X, because they're the only letter, they're, they're the letters that appear in Kurdish and not Turkish. So it was a, so they've criminalized Kurdish culture uh, in, in most of these countries. So you can imagine then the desire for Kurdish people for an independent Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. You know, that is kind of the, the starting point of an identity politics that was rooted in real discrimination and oppression. And so when uh, Abdullah Ocalan, the leader of the Kurds in Turkey, uh, founded the PKK f to meet the aspirations of the Kurdish people, the first manifesto in 1978 called specifically for uh, uh, Kurdistan. But uh, when um, he was uh, imprisoned uh, in 1990, his thinking began to evolve, and he saw actually that uh, this kind of excluded, ex to build a nation state on an exclusive identity is actually equally oppressive. You know, I mean, Israel being one example of that. Uh, but also, all the countries that had been fighting colonial struggles, when they had their own independent states, they were not democratic, they were not anti-patriarchal. So he, um, and also the places that the Kurds lived in were not exclusively Kurdish. So, you know, substantial proportions of Christians and Arabs and then Chechens and Turkmen and, you know, Armenians and so on and so forth. Um, so he realized that actually, you know, this is not the way forward. And the way forward was to build a, a true democracy, a sort of bottom-up, stateless structure. Uh, and it's um, driven by women. I mean, his, his, he's the first um, uh, fighter for freedom, independence, uh, that he, uh, who, are, who says that women are, 
should be at the forefront of a struggle that no nation can be free until its women are free. So he, you know, it's an, it's an amazing, it's an amazing political position and he's in prison, but who is implementing this society? And we don't know about it. I mean, most, when I came back in 2016 and I spoke uh, in public uh, places, hardly anybody had heard about it. And mm. when I was at the, uh, you know, border, all the journalists that were there were going to the front line because mm. they were interested in the battle against ISIS. Mm -hmm. But what was the society in which women were leading the charge against ISIS. You know, here we are in the West so concerned about the threat that is represented by uh, ISIS. But in practice, what did you experience in Syria in 2016? What did you see? How did well, it what go? I saw was a democracy, a genuine democracy in action. Mm -hmm. uh, women who had, you know, come, this, this is a very conservative part, or it's rural. It, there was uh, very low standards of education, and there were women who were taking, you know, the, the lead, whether it was cooperatives. I mean, it's, it's a very long story, but, you know, in the sense that um, Assad ruled by centralizing everything. Mm -hmm. So whilst this place called Rojava, where they grew all the wheat in Syria, they were not allowed to bake bread. Mm -hmm. It had to be uh, baked in Damascus. Mm -hmm. So uh, when the revolution happened, there was starvation mm -hmm. because they, they didn't have bread and they had to teach themselves to bake bread mm -hmm. really quickly. So they set up cooperatives. Women are leading many of these cooperatives and the whole of that society, so you, from neighborhood upwards, they represent, they represent, they elect their representatives on a co-presidentship rule. Mm -hmm. One man, one woman, mm -hmm. and that goes all the way up to district, regional, city, and then national how, how would you explain the success of that structure in Syria? And exactly. I mean, isn't it amazing? Because they're at the same time fighting, were fighting, mm -hmm. and now they're fighting Turkey because Turkey wants to obliterate them and mm -hmm. obliterate the revolution. But they were fighting ISIS, mm -hmm. and they were successful. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, behind the front lines, they were setting up this new society mm -hmm. where they run education classes. You know, it's like gender awareness training. So give you a little example. If, if a woman um, complains of domestic violence um, and they cannot resolve the, the, the problem, um, the guy will be arrested. And it's, it's the women police force called Asayish who will turn up and arrest the guy. He'll be sent to prison. He'll be given gender equality training uh, <laughs> when he's in prison. And then he will, when he is deemed to have been reformed or have understood it, and his partner, his wife, is prepared to take him back, then, she will, then he will go back. And then these local communes will monitor the situation so that he is never allowed to you know, go back to lapse into his old ways. So it's just, it's, you know, it's that kind of thing. And, and we are used to seeing, so if, again, talking about identities and how we stereotype Muslims, this is a Muslim community, but they're totally secular. Mm -hmm. They've banned religion from the public square. Mm -hmm. So the Sharia courts have been disbanded, whilst mm -hmm. in Britain we have Sharia courts, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, it's just amazing. They've, you know, polygamy is ended, forced marriages are criminalized. I mean, there's a whole long list of things that they have done in, and they, the revolution now is um, seven years old. But, what can we take out of that, of that structure? Because, I mean, I guess banning religion is not the, the, the only solution. How can we apply those patterns that they, 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 they use there in order to change society here? Well, that's a really difficult question to answer. And the reason, I think, is because they've actually built an economy which is anti-capitalist. Hmm. Um, and I think within a capitalist... It's, OK, so one answer, I think, is given to you by the Kurdish diaspora themselves. Mm. So there are Kurdish people living in Germany, Britain, France, you know, all over the place. And they have instituted the same uh, structures of democracy in their communities in Britain. So if they have a cultural arm, on the Cultural Council will sit equal numbers of men and women. Mm. Uh, women have the power of veto on any policies that, you know, go against uh, their views on mm. what will benefit women or not. Right. So that's how they've done it. So it's like a little bubble within a Western capitalist state. Right. 
and that's all I can suggest. Mm. And then, you know, we build democratic muscle, true... De and, I mean, look at what's happening with Boris Johnson and our democracy in Britain. We uh, need... Is there still a democracy? <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. So we need to build that democratic muscle. So yeah. come the revolution, we can actually... <laughs> be ready. That, be ready. Um, I want to open it up in a little bit for the public, public in uh, case they've got questions as well. But the final uh, topic I want to get into is class. I mean, you cannot talk about uh, uh, um, those identity politics without uh, considering class as well. Um, how would you respond to that? I think class is crucial, and I think it's, um, I think it's something that we don't pay enough attention to. But one of the things I do think was a caveat to um, actually focusing on class is not repeating some of the mantras that I've heard, certainly when I've been working on, on a base violence or forced marriage, where, when we've been working in communities, and then you hear um, s some members of, of, of our community saying, well, it's, you know, it's not us, we're educated, it's that uneducated lot over there, it's because they're illiterate, just, whereas actually we know that this happens at all levels. Yeah. Uh. Um, so I think we've, we've got to be mindful of class. Um, but I think, I think it's crucial that we... How, how can you be mindful of that? Because how you kind of change society completely and, you know... I think you have to look at... It's going back to looking at the impact of um, economic policies and what that does to different communities. So um, where, where I'm based and where I, I grew up in a mining community in the northeast, and, and you saw firsthand the decimation mm -hmm. of those communities... Um, you post Thatcher and um, and all that that she um, bestowed upon them, um, and the lack of investment. And then what that does is that then sets up fertile ground for division, and mm. you get you know the moving in of you know those far right parties, you know, playing on the fears of the white working class communities of it's those immigrants over there coming in here taking mm. our jobs. The same things that you know my parents' generation would have heard. Um, I certainly heard as a child are now being played out again. Mm -hmm. And then you've got that kind of victim mentality within, certainly within Muslim communities of the whole world is against us. So we've got to kind of retreat into our little groups. But is there enough representation from people from different classes? Isn't it politics or isn't media just mainly the playground of, of like a small select group of people that are not being inclusive to people from different classes as well? I to some degree, I think, but it depends on at which level. So if you're talking about national politics, I would say, yes, that's, that's mm -hmm. probably the domain of the elite. I think at a local level, when you see um, so-called community leaders exerting power, I think they've, um, a, a number of those come from working class backgrounds, mm -hmm. but um, speak on behalf of mm -hmm. or claim to be you know, the authentic voices of, mm -hmm. of the community. So I think it plays out differently. Mm -hmm. It depend, depends on where you are. Yeah. Um, but there are always those who are, who are ignored and marginalised and who don't have a space to, to speak up. I mean, the, the example of Rajava is, is absolutely incredible. But, you know, we hear time and time again about um, minority women, particularly, who were never given a space, and you're only given a space to speak mm -hmm. if what you say is in line with what minority men are saying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, for example, even some minority men, so Jimmy, for example, wouldn't be, you know, allowed a space because he's talking about LGBT issues and, you know, can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> is that the case? Definitely so. And I think, you know, uh, I know we've taken a few incidents, uh, a, few, a few spots in across the, the last two days to acknowledge Mariam and the work that she's done. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, actually, Mariam, for me, it's so bizarre that you haven't got an OBE or an MBE. And I, I work with people who've got these, you know, state awards that acknowledge them for the work that they have done. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and some of these people have done like a fraction of the work that you've done around human rights. But because your narrative isn't seen as acceptable as, as what a brown woman should be doing mm. and certainly not how she should be acting, you know, like, <laughs> shh, just lower your voice. Um, so, uh, and I think that that that's really goes against what um, 
uh, what society sees that we should be doing, and so platforms aren't given to us in the way that they should be. Just with but isn't it easier to take a platform through social media or other uh, other of those kinds of means? You don't need the traditional platforms anymore. So to to get a broader audience, Mariam deserves an MBE or an OBE. There is no getting away. Uh, there is no getting away from that. Like, it, it's, it's a colonial award. But yeah, it, it may be a colonial just, award. Sorry, could you she still it deserves it. <laughs> sorry, Will, could you repeat? No, I was just saying it's a colonial award. Yeah. But is it, why does she deserve it? That's, that's really... Because because can I just answer that, Jimmy? So, um, I'm, I'm not an ex-Muslim. Um, and I have to say that if it, if it wasn't for Mariam, I wouldn't have a platform to speak. Mm. Um, gosh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I've been coming to the conferences for a number of years. Mariam and I work really, really closely along with Gita and Pragna and Rahila and Jimmy and, and others. But there is so little space to have, um, as minority women, to be able to stand up and say, you know, that you want to challenge the racism that, that our communities face, that you want to stand up in solidarity for LGBT rights, that, you, you know, that you're a feminist. But to step outside of that box of what is expected of you as a, as a Muslim woman, you know, that I don't wear hijab, that I don't want to get into... I, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not interested in theological debates. I'm not an Islamic feminist. I'm not a reformer. I'm not into any of those things. And the only space that I've ever been able to have um, has been through Mariam. And she has defended me against attacks from atheists. Mm -hmm. And um, she's equally defended me um, from attacks from Islamists. And I think... There's a very unique role that she plays because she's able to hold the balance of, um, you know, of, of being. Um, I'll there. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think that you deserve recognition for your work because that's special and it's. Powerful and really important. Oh my God! Everybody's emotional. <laughs> <laughs> emotional. But 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 then the critical me comes <laughs> around the corner again. I mean, getting an OBE, a mini MBE. Why should you attach any value to those uh, old-fashioned systems? I mean, we we will create our new systems without the you know the recognition from something that's you know that's being that that deals with history. Actually, listen, that's okay. And in your utopian world, wherever that is, I'll come join you at some point. <laughs> but for the rest of us who are living in the Britain, in UK, in the 21st century, where the state gives awards to acknowledge commitment to the society that you live in, currently that's an MBE and an OBE. And I think actually the work that Mariam has done to empower the voices of ex-Muslims and dissenters, it needs to be acknowledged. But because, simply because it is ex-Muslims and dissenters, it won't be acknowledged for that very reason. Mm -hmm. I just... And also... And, and, and also, I think it's very important to, to, to realise that it's actually the state do build narratives mm. on a grand scale that, don't, that individuals, it, it takes them lifetimes mm. to do it. And now what Mariam has done, and if she gets rewarded for whatever the award is, sorry, I'm not from Britain, so I'm not sure about that, but uh, we have an equivalent of that Australia of, Australian of the Year. And, mm. the, and then, OK, now the narrative that is... That, that, that is established by that person who wins the award, mm. now more and more people listen to it and it legitimizes their narrative. And I think if, I think Mariam, what she's done, as I said, like I, I saw her 10 years ago for the first time and I related, in, in, in two seconds, I related with her more than I related with Richard Dawkins for the past five years or something. <laughs> and I, more people need to see that and that just legitimizes her efforts, basically. I, I agree I with that. And the final thing I want to ask about that is, by that legitimization, by the fact that she gets an MBA and OB, don't you uphold the old-fashioned structures that you want to fight against? How? Because giving the credit to an MBA or an OB, whereas... Yeah, I, I think... <laughs> no, but it's about... No, but, 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 Oh, that's interesting. She won't accept it. No, but it's about structures. I mean, it's about putting value into existing structures instead of building uh, alternative structures. But they're not as well. mutually exclusive. Like this is not mutually. We can build our own structures. This very conference is a structure that we've built ourselves and is giving platform to our voices. And if we and we even do our own award ceremonies, fantastic. But there's something that is divorced from the realities of the world. If you're saying that the existing structures don't promote in exactly the way that Harris said uh, an awareness. And 
and an appreciation of yeah. individuals who live within those structures. Right, and okay. building that narrative and a more inclusive narrative as well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> go right there. I would like to give the floor to the audience. Is there anybody? Oh, my goodness, there are people who would like to add something. Um, yeah, if you could use the microphone uh, in the left, on the left there. Yes. So um, there was a little bit of a struggle I heard on uh, defining identities uh, or using labels. And I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, an approach that I use, which is that instead of the unstated premise that an identity or an a label, uh, sorry, that a label that we use must be an all-consuming identity, for example, like a Muslim identity usually is a way of life and it's, you know, it's all-encompassing, we reject that unstated premise and use a label based on context. So for example, I don't go into a job application and say I'm an ex-Muslim, but I'll use that label as a badge of protest in the context, in the conversations where that matters. And this way we can use and pick and choose labels based on context and reject the, the idea that it has to be all-encompassing. What are your thoughts on that? Who would like to react? It's actually funny that I wanted to, to discuss that how I view identity, and, but, but, but again, I never got, got around to it. You're actually right. I mean, this is how I see it. I don't even think that the, being a Muslim, being brown or Pakistani, they should even be identifiers, so to speak. And this is what I was saying, that just your face and your, your name is your ID. The, the, we, we grew up, we heard that, okay, you're a Muslim, you're a Pakistani, that's your identity. Now, ha ha, you've left it all. What are you now? So, you... you, you, you Yes, and, and you go, okay, so hang on, I'm not any different at all, and I actually feel even more liberated that I can now, you know, like, I mean, it might be overstatement, but like, I'm a global citizen, and you know, all, all these kind of things. So, so they, they, they should not even be considered as identifiers or identities, and that, that, that's what I think. I mean, they, these are just political positions, religious positions, ideological positions. Mm -hmm. Don't confuse them with identities. Identity is your face. On your driver's license, it just shows your name and your face mm -hmm. and maybe your fingerprint. But, but can you disconnect, your, your, can you disconnect your, your, the labels that are being put on yourself, or a society puts on you, can you disconnect that from your identity? Is that possible? Because other people are using that to label you, to, to categorize you. I think what, what Sahel is saying, and I think what was uh, contained within your poem, Halima, and let me know if I'm wrong, is that identity is multifaceted. Mm -hmm. So the, asking me to, to summarize my uh, identity in one way, yeah. it's, it's just a, it's, it's something that's impossible to do, actually. Exactly. And so I, I completely concur with your supposition and your uh, poem, which was amazing, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Uh, before I, I uh, talk about this issue, I want to thank you all for being so kind about me. But the reality is that the reason I organize these things is because I think you are all heroes and I want the world to know who you are. So uh, I feel the same way about each and every one of you. Uh, but on the, on the issue of identity, and if I may, I, I mean, I think uh, the point that Keenan Malik was making, and I adore him, I, I worship him, and I, I, I think I, I agree with his position on things, and this is that when we use the uh, word ex-Muslim, it is not a promotion of identity politics, because, and I don't think it's even a trigger, I don't think I agree uh, using it even as a trigger, because I think identity politics is completely regressive. What it is, is saying we're ex-Muslims in a fight not for privilege, not for superiority, which is what actually identity politics means, but for equality. Mm -hmm. And so the fight for LGBT rights, for the, the right to vote, for uh, the right to be equal uh, when you're black in the civil rights movement and so on, that was a fight for liberation, not for uh, you know uh, being boxed into a small restrictive identity. Actually, identity politics excludes more people than it includes. And I think we need to make that distinction. I think Kinan Malik makes that distinction brilliantly. Mm -hmm. And I would actually love if he could comment on some of the things that have been said here, because it would be great to have his perspective on the discussions as well, if it's possible. Thank you. Can I just... Uh, yeah. Of course, we will go to you. There's a reaction from the panel first, I... and I would like to go to you, Kinan, if, if that's okay with you. I... Can I jump in straight after me? Yeah, of course, Rahim. I just, uh, the, I just want to clarify the whole issue of the trigger, and that is, for example, the fact that you have carried the banner of ex-Muslims. 
came out of your choice of a particular identity. It was a political identity. And you therefore then uh, campaigned and uh, you know, organized around that and built a group of people around that and built a kind of politics that came out of that. Yeah, exactly. But, that, but the, the starting point has to be, is often because who else will pick up because they haven't had the experience of being ex-Muslims, of, of rejecting it, of rebelling against it. You start from that position, but you don't end there. Mm. That, that's the, the point I was making. Um, so and I, what I'm about to say, I'd really be keen to hear your thoughts on. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to be quick because I'm mindful of time. So when I talked about the Inclusive Mosque Initiative and there was that demonization of white men. Uh, one of us went up to the, some of the white guys there and the gentleman apologized for being a white man. In my therapy room, I've had clients who have said, uh, my child, you know, she's really struggling and she's saying things like, oh, I've got anxiety, I've got depression, I'm fat and I'm white. What's the point of, you know, uh, like, like being alive? So we're seeing people self-hate because of whiteness as well. Mm -hmm. We had the first employment tribunal in the UK brought against the Metropolitan Police Force by a man who said, you didn't hire me for this job because I was a straight white male. Then uh, the investigation took place by the panel uh, and they found in his favor. So actually they didn't appoint him because they said he wasn't diverse enough because he was a straight white male. So what I'm seeing, and I think we have to be so vigilant against this, is identity politics being used as a veneer for anti-white racism. Mm -hmm. Kenan, I would like to hear your views on it. Thank you. Um, I, think, I think the problem's even deeper than that. I think what's happened, we, we talk now about whiteness and white privilege. We used to talk about racism, yeah. and they're actually different things. Mm -hmm. Racism <clears throat> is about the structures of the society, of the institutions in those societies that discriminates, uh, that oppresses people because of their skin colour or their faith or, or their culture. By reducing that to a quest of whiteness, we actually ignore the fact of the, 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 the institutional structures that, that cause our, 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 our issues. We, we, we personalise it, change it into a, a, a matter of psychology rather than of politics. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think you know, the whole way the debate goes at the moment about the problem is whiteness is really problematic. Mm. And the, the, what it does is it ignores the institutional structural uh, 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 discrimination we face. Can you elaborate um, a little bit on that, on those structures? What structures do we have to battle? Uh, well, we talk about immigration policy. So <laughs> that, I mean, what, more, what more do you need um, than a policy um, that uh, effectively says, um, I mean, to take, there's been a lot of talk about Brexit and about Europe. And there's a lot of talk about Brexit as being uh, anti-immigrant. Well, it seems to me that um, uh, that's, it's not surprising when the European Union, for the past 30 years, has built itself um, around a the idea that we keep out those who are not Europeans. <laughs> Freedom of movement for Europeans, but we're under siege from the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> that, that is a structural issue of, of racism, and we don't see it as such. You know, it is just, you know, it's just immigration policy. Immigration policy isn't somebody asking you for your passports. It's a coercive, militarised system by which certain groups of people are excluded mm -hmm. and other people are included. So that's what we, we should talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and that has nothing to do with whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, and the more we talk about whiteness and white privilege in those terms, the less we talk about those institutional structures that are the real problems. Can I just say one thing about identity? And, and what the, um, your, your question about what's your identity? Well, it depends who is asking. Yeah. Um, so I entirely depend, agree with this point about context. You know, who I am to my daughter is very different from who I am to this audience. Mm -hmm. And it's necessarily very different. Mm -hmm. So it's entire, the, the very question, who are, who are you, I think makes no sense. 
You are many things, depending on the context in which you are. And therefore, to, part of the problem is to say, is to, is to imagine that the question, who am I, mm. in a narrow sense, makes sense. It doesn't. Mm. Who am I? Well, it depends in what context, to whom, uh, and what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Um, but much more than that, I think this question about values and being, the problem with identity politics, it starts with being, who I am in, in that kind of um, sense of what is my being. That's always the wrong place to start. The, start. the starting point should be, what are you doing? How are you trying to change the world? What are you talking about? What are you acting upon? That's who you are, mm. not whether you're gay or black or Muslim. It is what you're doing to change the world. That's what you're doing. Thank you. I think, I, think, I think you're completely right. I think that um, within this society that you talked about as well, it's very difficult to shake off those labels and have that definition. But I think it's a step that we should head to. If you don't mind, I would like to give the floor to the audience as well. Is there, yes, somebody? I, I, I promised this man a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I think this will be quick. Well, first of all, just comment, uh, Jimmy, you need to be at every human rights conference that anybody ever organizes and needs to speak. I'm the spokesman, Jimmy Bangash. And my uh, question for you is, uh, you know, you were talking about the group of uh, the ex-Muslim LGBT activists and then Muslim LGBT. Can you work together or can you, or is it a clash? Is there any resolution to that? Do you have any strategy in terms of how to go about it? Yeah, so I think, you know, first of all, can we work together? I hope so. Definitely, I hope so. Um, but <laughs> but uh, I think um, convergence isn't built in a day, yeah? Uh, and I think actually conversations are what build convergence. Um, and so I, I think what has happened historically is that actually when we look at ex-Muslims and Muslims, Muslims are the in-group, ex-Muslims are the out-group. Within that dynamic, you have LGBT Muslims, and they uh, are often fighting for acceptance by the wider group of Muslims. And what happens within these power dynamics is often actually by saying, well, those ex-Muslims are really bad, by LGBT Muslims saying, those, those ex-Muslims are offensive, they're really bad, what in some ways you're saying is, see to the, to, the, to the more dominant group, you're saying, see, we're not as bad as them, we're like you. Uh, and so it's this aligning against us which seeks to have them have acceptance. But throughout the whole history of human rights, your rights have never been won by tailoring your conversation so that it is palatable to your oppressor. That has never happened, yeah? It's always about resistance and fighting for the universal human rights that you're fighting for. Okay. Thank you, thank you. That was, a, that was a gasp from you. That's why I wanted to know. Because we work in the oh, same space. One second. Uh -huh. in Britain and I work in Germany. Uh -huh. So it's not easy. It's uh, like you have to literally walk in those waters and see what you can say and what you cannot say, because at the same time, if you would say something against LGBTI Muslims, that can undermine them within the Muslim community. But at the same time, we have a fundamental opinion of differences. Mm. Like, I don't believe that uh, a man, a, hit, a, cistro, a cis heterosexual man, should be allowed to marry a nine-year-old girl but an LGBTI Muslim can somehow revolve around that and also sugarcoat it, and then you present that she was all uh, 13, I think, when she had consummated the marriage. And I was like, come on, you are a Muslim and you are a gay, and you think that it is okay to molest a child. Hmm. Like, we have a fundamental difference of opinion when it comes to being Muslim and non-Muslims, or ex-Muslims, hmm. whatever you want to say. Hmm. But at the same time, what Jimmy said, we have to be very careful that LGBTI people of migrant, or I think of uh, um, communities that are not uh, native communities like the Europeans, they need to be very careful and they should show solidarity to each other mm -hmm. instead of fighting against each other. Thank you. Can, can I Thank just you. add to that? Of course. I don't think this is just an issue for LGBT communities, whether they're ex-Muslim or Muslim. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's something much deeper and darker going on in terms of, um, so last year when Mariam had organized the, the secularism conference, um, so you said in the biography that I'm a, a, a fellow of the Muslim Institute, I am no longer, and I'll explain why. Um, 
the inclusive mosque and um, uh, the, um, the Muslim Institute were part of it and other Muslim organisations um, set up a conference that was anti-secularism. And I didn't go to that, I wasn't invited because I'm, I'm obviously not a good enough Muslim, but um, there was... <laughs> that, that was a platform to attack ex-Muslims, to attack Mariam and, and, and my friend Gida um, particularly, without any acknowledgement of actually they're fighting for, for Muslim rights as well. And so I think um, whilst uh, I'm all, always hopeful and, and I think solidarity, because we're all in this fight together, is, is crucially, crucially important, I, th I, I feel uh, somewhat defeated and feel that we're a long way from that because there isn't the space to even have the conversation. The walls have gone up and I don't think the walls have gone up from this side. I, I really do think the walls have gone up from, from the other side. Um, I, I feel, you know, the Muslim Institute produces a periodical called Critical Muslim. Yeah, critical within a certain boundary, but mm. don't step outside of that boundary. Um, and I think to attack in the way that they have done without recognising the dangers that, that speaking up place you under, whether you're... Um, you know, whether you're an ex-Muslim or whether you take on the beast that is Amnesty International or, you know, you take on, on any other. But I do, I do feel that, um, that, that, that that wall has gone up. Mm -hmm. And, and I, don't, I don't want to get into the text or whether, you know, you know, the theological aspects of it. Let's come at it from a purely hu human perspective. Where is the humanity mm -hmm. in recognising that we all have a right to think and believe in what we choose to believe? Mm -hmm. And that if someone believes in something different to you, if you've got, you know, why should it threaten you to that degree that you need to go on the attack? You and can't convince them. I don't want to convince them. But no, 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 but, no, but you can't convince them to think that, okay, we have a right to exist, we don't believe in that, unless you actually show them how much shit is in their beliefs. You, you, that, that's the nicest way to put it in. I don't think that will work. And well, I, I, I think it's know, working. We can agree well, why don't you think that will work? I think it's working. Um, because I, I, I mean, I don't think I would be the person that I am who, who stands up in solidarity with Jimmy and Mariam without um, you know, the framework of my culture and my religion and my heritage and all that it's given me. And, and OK, you know, I, I stand up and say I completely denounce slavery, and this, whether it's sex slavery or any form of slavery, um, child marriage, polygamy, uh, violence against women, violence against gays. All of that, and I want equality as, as a woman, and I'll absolutely take that to my dying breath. Um, and I think, yes, challenge the ideas, absolutely challenge the ideas, but we have to in the future, we have got to, all of us, but this is a call out not to the people necessarily in this room, but to the people who, who are Muslims and who remain Muslims, of come to the table, mm -hmm. because if you don't come to the table, we will all go down together. Mm. Yeah. Because no racist is going to carry out, and no racist is going to carry out an ethnic monitoring exercise before they kick the living hell out of one of us. Mm. And the far right are on the march, and we have got to remember that we're all under attack. Mm. It's it's time. <laughs> No, well, what I'm struggling with at the moment is that it's time to close the program off, unfortunately, because we ran out of time. But this is not the note I want to close off on, because no, no, no don't excuse yourself. But it's, it, it is, it is about, it, it is about looking, uh, looking forward, and there are still loads of questions as well. But I want to focus on um, how to go beyond, how to go beyond identity politics or how to be aware of those multifaceted identities that we all have in all different kinds of contexts. Where should we go to from now? Where should we head to? What, we sh what should we strive for? Is it a matter of time? Is it, is, are things are going to change you know, after a while of time? Is it just waiting until that time arrives? What should we do? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. Maybe you should, go, because we stream as well, maybe we should have a microphone so we, people, everybody can hear what you have, which is... Like, if we focus on broader structures, we've got a better chance. If 
bringing up even our ex-Muslim identity, all the Muslim identity, all you're doing is breaking us down. Like, I, I have actually got a serious problem with the, the, the term Muslim heritage, which Jimmy uses. I absolutely hate that, because that's another very, very divisive term that's used within our communities. Just focus on this broad, these broader issues that we were talking about. Um, class, you know, sex, those kind of divisive things that were the, the, the divisive broader structures, and we'll do better, surely? Will we? And he put it, he put it so eloquently. If I say it, I sound white, but he said it so eloquently. <laughs> Kieran, Kieran, is that the way forward? Should we focus on that in order to break down the barriers or break down the... I, I think I've spoken enough, so I, I don't want to take up more time. But yes, I, th I think what matters is that, is that we challenge the structures, the institutional structures of discrimination, of racism, of bigotry. But how can we do that if there's no solidarity within those small groups within society? Ignore them. Yeah. And, and I think there, there, there will always be um, sectionalism. There will always be those kinds of um, uh, uh, arguments um, and disputes. Irrespective of that, the question I think we need to ask ourselves is, where does the problem lie? What is behind the problem, and how do we attack it? I think those, those are the issues. Mm. And part of the problem is that, is that we, we look at that question the wrong way. Mm. All I'd say is, ask yourself, where does the problem lie, and how should we undo the problem? Yeah. What? And don't be misled by other other problem, problems that arise that lead you from the real question. Don't get distracted by that. Anything you would yeah. like to add? Well, I, I, just, I mean, there are so many massive and pressing issues at the moment. I mean, I think that our democracy is, you know, on the point of collapse, and that is central in some ways to equal representation, to equality, to human rights, to, you know, all of that. We can, we can all um, unite against that kind of an issue, you know, mm. or in support of creating a proper democracy. There are talks, there's talk now about people's assemblies, about people taking over local services, local authority services. In, in the way in which we do those politics, we can make sure that we're actually representative of all the people in society. Uh, but not in any kind of um, schematic way, but making sure that everybody has a voice. Those are the kinds of things that we can all unite again, which go beyond whether we are Muslims or we are black women or whatever. But having had the experience of having fought on these specific issues, we bring that knowledge, that, that experience, that understanding of politics into something broader like that. I mean, and another big thing, which I don't want to go into now, but we, I think we're also on the brink of co uh, the collapse of the system itself. Mm -hmm. And Brexit, et cetera, is a, is a kind of symptom of all of that. We need to capitalize on that rather than just looking inward and thinking about you know, how you're encroaching on my space and how I'm encroaching on your space. Right. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's time to end the program. Thank you so much. Thank you for our panel, and thank you for you guys visiting. Thank you, Jürgen, for sharing. Thank you. Jürgen Jonah, for, thank you for sharing, and it's very, very good to have you back as a chair <laughs> at the Bali. It's, very, it's great, great sharing. Uh, thank, thank you for your uh, cooperation on this emotional and really important panel. It was so great to hear Kinan Malik speak. We have a last panel at 8 o'clock. Um, uh, make sure in between you eat. We have food as well. Um, and there's a party at 10 o'clock to uh, close it off. Um, and I think, um, speaking about identity, um, if it's other people who are reducing you into your identity, unasked and with power in their mind, mm -hmm. it's a very bad thing. If you try to build up your identity by, by be becoming the LGBT person you want to be, or by coming, then it's a wonderful thing, of course. Yeah. So it's, it's not only who's asking, it's also who's saying it, of yeah. course. Completely. And thank you very much for uh, joining. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh.
Your mind games in, let your mind games in, let your mind.